as we watch all that's going on in the markets and the economy, we all have at least one eye on the Middle East and what's going on in Israel. And to take us through that right now, we welcome somebody who really knows that area terribly well. He's Daniel Kurtzi, he's professor of Middle East policy at Princeton and former U.S. ambassador to Israel. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for joining us now. I'm not going to ask you to be clairvoyant, but from what you understand of the region right now, what comes next? Are they definitely, the Israeli Defense Forces, definitely going to go into Gaza? No, I don't think that's certain. Uh, certainly not in the uh, next day or so, because I think the Israelis are concerned that Hamas has planned a second act. In other words, uh, assuming that Israel was going to come in on the ground, setting booby traps, ambushes, and all kinds of uh, other devices to try to trap Israel inside. So you've seen Israel mobilize 350,000 of its reserves, but they're being very cautious uh, uh, before they decide whether to move in, and they're using their, their air force to uh, soften up uh, the target and then make a decision what to do. We've seen some horrific things in the Middle East in that region. Have we seen anything of this like? You know, you, you can look at what ISIS has done, the, the uh, publicity they gave to beheadings. You can go back to some of the genocides in uh, the Great Lakes region of Africa. You can go back to the Holocaust. Um, this ranks up there with those kinds of uh, horrific, inhuman uh, actions, uh, really that defy uh, our, our whole system of, uh, of culture and morality. Um, you know, we don't support terrorism, but terrorism is supposed to have a political goal. This goal looks like it was simply to kill a lot of Israelis and Jews, and uh, there's no other explanation for what Hamas has done. One of the things we're all concerned about uh, is the possibility of it spreading beyond Israel, particularly to Lebanon in the north with Hezbollah, but also even over to Iran. What is the calculus there from Iran's point of view and from the United States as well as Israel? Well, I think both Hezbollah and Iran are looking very carefully at, uh, at what Israel does next and whether they can exploit those next steps. Hezbollah has been quite careful not to uh, launch missiles. Uh, they've done some action every day as a kind of station identification, but uh, not enough to uh, provoke an Israeli response. Israel, I think, uh, is prepared. Up north, uh, many of their reserves were mobilized to the north. Um, and I think the fact that the United States has now sent two uh, aircraft carrier strike groups to that region uh, sends a direct message to Hezbollah that an attack on Israel might actually become an attack on the United States. Uh, they don't know that. Ambiguity uh, works in our favor in this case. Same thing applies to Iran. Uh, they certainly have played a role in arming, equipping, training Hamas. Uh, they're hoping to gain something from it, but I'm not sure they believe they can gain in the long term, uh, depending on Israel's response now. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, this is, of course, first and foremost, a humanitarian issue. Uh, we worry about the suffering and the death over there. At the same time, there are economic consequences, potentially. What does it potentially mean for the Israeli economy, which has been so vibrant? Well, first, David, on the humanitarian issue, I think uh, part of Secretary Blinken's agenda while in the region, especially in Israel, is uh, to speak to them quietly about uh, this issue of the siege on Gaza. Uh, I don't think we're going to say anything publicly, but um, I think the secretary is going to suggest to the Israelis that they don't want to become the story by creating a worse humanitarian crisis in Gaza than already exists. Uh, and his conversations there and elsewhere in the region, I think, will be directed at finding some way to relieve some of the uh, water, health, food issues uh, that are plaguing Gaza right now. On the economic side, you know, Israel with a reserve army uh, cannot really uh, withstand the long-term mobilization of its forces because uh, much of the economy shuts down. Uh, uh, I was speaking to people today in Jerusalem, and they say that it looks a little bit like COVID, when there were few people on the streets, yeah. many stores were closed down. Those stores that are open are seeing their shelves cleared of, uh, of goods as people stockpile. So there, there, there won't be a long-term mobilization, which means that Israel's calculations uh, will need to be will need to factor in the economic consequences as they decide whether or not to go into Gaza with a uh, ground force. 
Professor, before this horrific attack, there, was a, there were hopes being raised that maybe there would be some sort of arrangement, including Saudi Arabia and Israel and the United States, for a peace agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Is that off the table? Well, it, it certainly was one of the targets of Hamas. I don't think it was their main target, but uh, both Iran and Hamas feared an Israeli-Saudi normalization would be a transformative event in the region and would uh, further isolate uh, Iran and uh, its supporters. Uh, it certainly is off the table in the immediate period ahead. The Saudis are covering their bases. They've uh, been critical of Israel over these first few days. But they are not happy at all with Hamas. They never have been. Hamas has not been one of their favorite uh, organizations. And so I think the Saudis are going to wait to see uh, how badly Hamas is hurt, uh, decapitated, uh, its infrastructure destroyed, its organization uh, undermined. Uh, and then at some point, uh, Saudi self-interest will kick back in, and we can resume the discussions that are underway about normalization. But for the time being, I think uh, it's on hold. Uh, finally, Professor, uh, for those of us old enough to remember the Yom Kippur War of 1973, it was horrific from Israel's point of view. And yet, ultimately, out of that arguably came the Camp David Accord. Is there any prospect here that actually this could turn around over time and actually bring a positive result? Look, I've given 48 years of my professional life to exactly that objective. So I hope the answer is yes. But I think I think we're going to be absorbed in the aftermath of the fighting with what to do about Gaza. Uh, is there a way to reconstruct it both uh, physically and politically in a manner that uh, prevents the rise of the son of Hamas or the next terrorist group? Uh, is there a way for the Palestinian Authority to resume uh, leadership? Uh, is there a way for the international community to help the Palestinian Authority, the PLO, uh, find an avenue uh, in which to resume negotiations or discussions with Israel. But I think the first order of business is going to be Gaza. Um, it's, it's already in a very bad state, and it's going to be worse. And I think that's going to be uh, item number one on the agenda.